Um, I want to talk to you about uh, a couple little odds and ends. Uh, is Ray Murphy, have you kept in touch with him? Oh, very infrequently. Best you know he's still alive? Yeah. Um, when you were... The way, the way you get in touch with him is you uh, ask the Association of Graduates where he is. He, or, or he is listed in the uh, retired officer file. He's a major general retired. Oh, uh, when you were director of cadet activities, mm -hmm. uh, is it up to you to recruit the uh, officers to be the sponsors for these fifty things? Well, they were sort of self-recruiting. Oh. Okay. One guy would leave and he'd look for his replacement? Well, you, as an example, the social science department had uh, several things that they, the SCUSA was one that they sponsored, the debate council and forum they sponsored. Uh, or something like the Glee Club, it took some people who were interested in the Glee Club. Right. If it, uh, if it turned out to be water polo, a uh, guy now, General Max Noah, was on the committee, but he was a, uh, he ran the work hall. So, some of it was self-recruited. Uh, there was a guy there who ran skydiving, he was a hot skydiver, he was a, uh, uh, fencing, had been a Navy uh, fencing champ. He was a Marine officer stationed up there, but he had been a Marine fencing. He'd been a Navy fencing guy when he was at Annapolis. So, uh, a lot of it was self-recruited. They were actually interested in it. Uh, yeah. Well, it was a, another opportunity to come in contact with cadets in an off-duty environment. You know, after the academics or after the uh, tactical department did its thing, these guys were uh, either in a core squad activity, some core squad activity, the current dean up there, a guy named Jerry Galloway, was the uh, officer uh, in charge of uh, the uh, Cadet Glee Club. Then later, when he's uh, back up there as a faculty member, as a colonel, he was the uh, officer in charge of the uh, Army football team. So it, it was part of the climate of the institution to ask officers to participate in extracurricular activities with the cadets. So that wasn't your job then to find them? Well, if I had one that wasn't covered, covered then I had to get it covered. Yeah, well, that figured. But there was sort of a hand-me-down game that went on. I was, the uh, first year I was there, I was the uh, number two guy in the glee club. I'd been, a, I'd been a singer myself before, and a uh, barbershop quartet singer and that kind of stuff, sang all during high school and in college and all that, so I was interested in that, so I participated in it. When you were at Fort Bliss, did you know Wemo Webinar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. kept, up, kept up with him for a long time. Last I heard of him, he was in the officer personnel directorate. Yeah, as a full colonel. There was another, there, there was a theme that you mentioned from time to time, and that is that you were having fun while you were in the Army. Um, I had fun while I was in it, but I sort of thought I was the Lone Ranger. Uh, most of the time, the people that I was working with were full of gloom, gloom and fear and anxiety and concern about not measuring up. Um, it sounds like there wasn't much of that in the 11th Airborne. No. And I doubt if there was much of that at Fort Bliss. Did you ever encounter a, a, a down attitude? Or was it, were, the, were your colleagues having fun? Oh, I suspect that there were some people that didn't have fun, I mean, in various and sundry uh, places. Uh, 
I think a lot of uh, having fun in the Army is being around good people, being around people you admire, you're proud to serve with, being around good subordinates, uh, being able to become inter interconnected with the families of various and sundry people. Uh, now, I mentioned one battery commander that worked for me who uh, ultimately I had to relieve when I was in the 82nd Airborne Division Artillery. And I'm sure he didn't have fun. No. Uh, but that was an institutional well, no, error, I think, really. I, no, I think, I think what it was, it was he was ill-suited for that particular job, and when somebody gave it to him, he didn't uh, decline it, he, he took it and uh, hoped for the best. And uh, you don't do that, you have to work at it. Right. So I guess my, my general view is uh, there are people that go through the Army with anxiety. And uh, fortunately, I haven't served with a lot of them. You know, most of my people I've served with have been uh, genuinely upbeat. I think anybody gets down on a given day, you can be down. But right. right. In the main, I think, uh, I think that the uh, army and service life in general is one of those things that you have to be upbeat about it. You have to like it. It doesn't pay you a lot. Uh, so you have to get the psyche rewards of thinking that it's it's a good professional. Uh, service that you're rendering and you enjoy it. The next question is related to that one. It's, it's sort of choice points. Uh, one choice point that we went past was when the guy from RCA offered you a job and you really didn't seriously consider it, I gather. Yeah, I, I mean, that was a, that's one of those things that uh, was an aggrandizement of the moment. Uh, it was very nice of him to say that. He said it a couple of times in a period of about three days. And uh, so I think he probably meant it. I had no intention of leaving service. I was, you know, I was full of what I was doing and uh, had no intention of departing. So I gave it not one Thank whit so of much. thought. Didn't look at it. Thank you, ma'am. Didn't uh, give it one whit of thought. Didn't ask how much, didn't say what I'd be doing, nothing, none of that. Well, you, you must have made a decision fairly early on. I mean, you had another choice point, a three-year spot where you could have said goodbye, and you were in Europe then, and uh, you must have made a decision by then. Do you remember thinking about it much, or did you get when I got the No, when I got in the Airborne, uh, well, first of all, I'd made a choice to go from a reserve officer to a regular officer because I had that authority when I had graduated. It was a residual authority and graduated as a DMG. Right. Uh, and when I made that decision, then I was good for three years. So it, that put me at a three-year mark. Well, at the three-year mark, I had just got to Europe. I mean, so Europe was high adventure for a young guy, 26 years old. 25 years old, three years out of college, uh, going all over Europe, seeing things, learning how to ski, traveling to Vienna, uh, going to Berlin, uh, in the field training, I mean, all the kind of stuff that you just want to do when you're a, a lieutenant in the Army. I mean, I mean, there was any money shortage, there certainly wasn't in our unit. I mean, we went to the field all the time, you know, never worried about where the money was coming from. Those things were, were beyond my pale. I was a lieutenant and uh, it was it was great fun. So uh, the idea of then when the three-year mark, you had to do something to get out there at the three-year mark. Yeah, you'd have to resign, right? Well, you had to put a paper in. So yeah. I, nobody came around and said, would you put your paper in here because, you know, you've reached three-year mark. So uh, you could say by de default, I stayed in until I finished a uh, three and a half year tour with the, uh, in, in an overseas unit. Uh, then the next thing was on the list was go to the advanced course and uh, 
so you sort of say, well, geez, I guess I ought to go to the advanced course, and then go to the advanced course, and next thing you know, you're going down and you're teaching rockets and missiles, something you don't know anything about, so that's sort of adventuresome. And you know, all the while, you are, you are motoring along with your contemporaries. I think one of the, one of the things that uh, people get antsy about is uh, am I getting promoted ahead of time? Am I getting promoted about the right time? Am I lagging in promotion? Well, in the uh, 50s and early 60s, uh, everybody's getting promoted with everybody else. I mean, so your your group got promoted and that was sort of it. So, uh, maintain relationships with the people that I'd served with in uh, Germany, and a lot of us were now serving back in the uh, United States. Several of us had come back to Fort Bliss, Texas to serve, so... Uh, things are going well. I mean, didn't have, didn't have to make a decision, because wasn't looking for an opportunity to get out. Wasn't, wasn't any decision time about it. Now, if I'd have stayed down there and kept working for the drunk at El Paso, uh, then that would have been different. I mean, I mean, that may have forced me to make a decision, uh, but I didn't have to because the left went to Vietnam. And there was another time, wasn't it, a, a firm in West Virginia offered you a, a senior job? No, I was back in my hometown in North Carolina. That, that comes after I've been to combat in Vietnam. I'm now a lieutenant colonel. I've been a battalion commander. Guy asked me to be a vice president, senior vice president of a furniture company. Furniture. Yeah, and down in North Carolina. And that I gave consideration to. So, well, why? You know, and, and, and here it was, 1968. Fall, late fall of 68. And uh, it, yeah, I, don't, I don't think it was a matter of a disillusionment with Vietnam. I think it was more a case of, okay, I've, I've done what a soldier is trained to do. A soldier is trained to go to combat. And I had led 600 men in a unit of my branch in combat. So I had done what a young officer would expect to do. And now this was uh, 68, so I had 15 years of service in the Army, and I had completed my battalion command. Now today, the average guy hasn't gotten to his battalion in 15 years, probably. But uh, the, uh, the notion of having done that sort of had fulfilled a uh, major objective in my life. Now, if I'd, and then I was in a staff belt in Washington in the Pentagon, and I, I very frankly didn't like that too well. Now, I liked the people I was working for, but I mean, it, it was a, uh, I was in a famous group that uh, Mike Malone uh, epitomized in his article called Winners Lose. I'd been a successful battalion commander in combat, and came back to the Pentagon, probably had uh, 35,000 people working in the Pentagon. Mike Malone, <coughs> Mike Malone, Mike Kuzlin, a uh, number of us had, had come back out of the war and gone to the Pentagon from combat in Vietnam. I got back in and I told you the story about the uh, secretary told me that she could only do one of two things, either she'd Xerox, or type, but she couldn't Xerox and type, so you got to do one or the other. Well, now here I had been leading 600 guys in combat, and now I was a Xerox operator. That's a uh, pretty good size downer. So when you come off of a battalion command and go into the Pentagon for the first time, uh, that's a rude shock. I think it is now. I think it is a, a guy that's the guy that's been in the Pentagon goes out and commands a battalion. He comes back, not a problem. 
But if the guy's his first time in the Pentagon and comes in there and he's an action officer and he's commanded a battalion in the field, big downer. So I took a look at that and I said, you know, yeah, maybe I, maybe I will do a job in business. So I gave that some thought, but I mean, I was rescued by the Army then by them getting appointed to the uh, war So I made that decision not to go in business and it didn't ever enter my mind again. It didn't work about then. Okay, that cleans up the odds and ends. Uh, pick up with PA and E. Yeah, let me go back to. Uh, I'm not sure what we said about uh, Tradoc in the uh, couple of years there. Those two years, uh, working for Depew. Depew, Gorman, Bertishaw and Combat Development, Gorman and Training and, and Bertishaw and Combat Developments. Uh, okay, if I try to try to put together a montage of my life in the military, uh, as a lieutenant colonel, I was given uh, an opportunity to understand the breadth of the Army headquarters and what it did, because I ran the Army program as Lieutenant Colonel for essentially three years. And so with that and interacting with the Department of Defense, I understood the interrelationship on matters pertaining to uh, fiduciary responsibility, the ability to get money out of Congress, uh, programming on a long time horizon. Uh, and, and I saw some really, truly expert guys uh, run the business here. Uh, Depew was the A vice at the time, Bruce Palmer was the vice at the time, Westmoreland was uh, the chief. Uh, so it really was a fascinating opportunity to see the uh, how, how the staff worked, both with, with itself and was directing the drawdown of the armed forces after the uh, Vietnam War and how it worked with the OSD and the Congress. Going to trade off was quite a different uh, view. And, and the view that I got there was how a man with a vision could change the Army. And, in, and how he did that was through the power of persuasion and intellect. And because he didn't have the authority to change it, the authority rested in the Army staff. Uh, the Chief of Staff still made decisions, but, but here's a case where a man, in the case of Depew, aided and abetted uh, by uh, principally Gorman and uh, Bertie Shaw, among others, uh, was, was able to change the structure of doctrine, of combat developments, that's bringing on new equipments, of uh, training inside of the training base itself, and training inside the Army itself and then persuade the Army to adopt what it was his vision said it ought to be. And so that, that's, that was an exciting opportunity uh, that, that forever created with, with my mind that while the Army is, is an enormous bureaucracy,
that uh, single individuals can move it. So Depew moved it, I think Gorman moved it, later Starry moved it, uh, and yet they never held the uh, major job, which is the chief of staff of the Army. But they all moved the Army, dramatically. Saw so Shoemaker do that at uh, Forces Command. Shoemaker did one of the things that uh, I think was one of the, one of the most uh, pervasive changes in the way in which the Army worked, and that is he invented the capstone program, which is allowing the reserves for the wartime mission. Brilliant uh, piece of work. He's never been given, given credit for it, and uh, just an absolutely uh, dynamite piece of work. Gave, gave substance and uh, breadth to uh, the reserves and the National Guard in the way in which they had had before. Now, wh why do I make that point? I make that point by saying that many people, even generals, believe they get caught up in uh, the uh, bureaucracy of things and that they have to obey whatever the regulations are as opposed to create the regulations. And so the, the, the opportunity to observe Depew work on the Army staff and issue the first uh, doctrine that came out in 1975, 75 or 76, uh, the airline battle, the uh, the airline battle doctrine of its time later modified substantially by uh, uh, Don Starry. Those two guys in succession uh, did something that can't be replicated probably in the Army. And uh, Gorman invented a new training system and then Depew bought it and got it sold in the Army. And that was tasks, conditions, and standards. Uh, codified in uh, manuals, soldiers' manuals, and RTEPs, and uh, and then uh, wisdom of beginning the National Training Center, which started uh, in 1975, and it took five years before it ever came to fruition. But the uh, seed was laid by both uh, Foreman and uh, Debut. So that plays a new role in my life when I get to be a, a guy that can also make waves in a different way. And uh, I think it's just important to say that I had never been up close to a guy for, for an extended period of time in an operational building where he's an operational commander. I'd been next to this guy when he was a, a staff officer and seen him move staff stuff around. But the ability to go out in the field and create it and change it and the whole army changes and all that kind of stuff. He, he understood how to market, although nobody would ever accuse him of being a marketeer. No, he, he had peers and, and very... But he had to market his peers, and yeah. he had to market his bosses, and uh, one of the things he always said to me was, I've got to have something new every month to give the Department of the Army, otherwise they'll figure out something for me to do. So i got to figure out something for them to do once a month. So he'd have a project a month, he'd dump it on. Well, the He's been uh, chief of staff of the Army, whoever that might be. Uh, PA and E. I come into PA and E, and it's like going home. I mean, I know about it. I've been there for three years, so I know what it's supposed to do. And uh, I take it over from John McGifford, who then became my boss. He became the director of the Army staff. And uh, General Bernie Rogers was the uh, chief for the first year and a half. I was the PA and E, and then uh, General Shymar took it over. And uh, he was there about six months before he ordered me out to the recruiting service. And essentially, uh, what you were doing is you were we were operating with a. Uh, T 
tail end of the uh, Democratic, or correction, the Republican administration. Uh, Mr. Ford was still in office, and uh, Marty Hoffman, as I recall, it was Secretary of the Army. And uh, then uh, he had succeeded a guy named Bob Froke. And then uh, when the administration changes in 1970, uh, this would be 79 now. Does that make sense? Let's see. New administration comes in either let's see, it comes in in an odd it comes in in a uh, odd year odd year so it must have been seventy nine uh, no it comes in seventy seven seventy six yeah election is seventy six and the uh, administration comes in seventy seven so I'm I don't come there until seventy seven so I'm there. And Clifford Alexander, I forget what I said about that, because that's Sproke and, and uh, Marty Hoffman. Marty Hoffman was the secretary, under, the last secretary under the, the Ford administration, but Sproke had served there when I was a lieutenant colonel, as following uh, resort. But at any rate, I come back in. Now, Clifford Alexander is the uh, Secretary of the Army, and uh, we have some uh, whole new team there to sort of absorb, and they get on board. And uh, so by the summer of '77, when I get there, this team is a is assembled, and we're they, they get inaugurated in. Let's see, is that right? 76? Yeah, 96. Carter's crowd coming in. So they get their, they get inaugurated in 77, January 77. So I come in, in June of 77, and by that time, uh, the team is just about assembled, and they're about ready to get themselves organized as the new squad on the block. And uh, several things begin to happen at, about that. For example, uh, the uh, Carter had gone down to uh, Norfolk and given a speech where he derided uh, the uh, training establishment of the several services as a waste of time. Now you understand this is a guy that had been a nuclear submariner and under Rickover, Rick and of course Rickover had his own training program, which is very exhaustive and extensive. <clears throat> but he was, but he Rickover didn't have time for war colleges and staff colleges and that guy. He just had time for his own stuff. So uh, he poo pooed everything else, and uh, President Carter did the same. Nominee Carter did the same in a speech in Norfolk. So, one of the first things we had to fight off was this humongous cut of the training establishment. And uh, they wanted to take it down by about 50%. And uh, this would be the schools for junior officers and everything. everything. Leavenworth, the War College, knock it all off, you know, reduce it by 50%. Gigantic cut in the training base. And uh, Don Starry now, by this time, had taken over the uh, Training establishment, uh, Trey Dock from Depew. Depew retired in the summer of uh, '77. After four years at the helm of Trey Dock, '73, '77. And Starry was in, and we faced with all these problems of uh, reducing the training establishment. So we had to fight that battle. Bernie Rogers had to fight that battle. I had to go up and fight it with Harold Brown. Uh, there was substantial uh, cuts still residual from Vietnam, taken down the size of the uh, armed forces. Uh, but by now, we sort of stabilized into the 13th and 3rd Divisions. Uh, there was very little money in the uh, procurement account, but a substantial amount of money in the research and development accounts for uh, 
the big five systems, uh, which were beginning to uh, push their way through to uh, coming to closure in uh, the Where it's getting in a position where they would be able to come to production. And so there were internal, you know, continuing battles with the OSD staff on why do you need a Black Hawk and why do you need an Apache helicopter and why do you need a uh, Bradley and why do you need an M1 tank and why do you need a Patriot missile system? And there were fits and starts. Uh, the Patriot had a call Sam D at that time and the Patriot had a uh, difficult time, it was a very complex system and had a very difficult time. Project managers were trying to bail it out and the company was trying to bail it out. So there was a, it's quite a great deal of turmoil in the Sherman accounts. Uh, and meanwhile, down at the ranch, we were beginning to go down the sump in the all-volunteer force. Bob Yerkes takes over as the uh, Desper of the Army. Takes over from DeWitt Smith, who goes back to Carlisle to become the, as you recall, Smith had two tours as the uh, head of the Army War College. He had one as a major general and got promoted to three stars and went back as a two star and commanded Carlisle once again finally retiring as three-star, but Bob Yorks was now the uh, Desper, and a guy named Bill Mundy was the uh, chief recruiter. And uh, we began to have some considerable problems with the recruiting service. One of the things that had occurred is that the reserves were just going down and down and down, the National Guard was going down and down and down. And General Bernie Rogers had given the reserve recruiting mission to the recruiting service, and that was a big uh, pill to swallow. But uh, Gene Forrester was the uh, head of the recruiting service at that time, and uh, he uh, took that on with great uh, uh, energy and began to put in place the mechanism to go and recruit the reserves. But at that time, it was difficult to uh, recruit reserves or National Guard. One of the things that we did up in the Army staff was uh, a uh, colonel working for me named Paul Donovan uh, took a couple of people and we created in the PA and E, and several major programs to try to turn around the uh, reserves in terms of uh, quality on the one hand, resources for the reserves, putting some active duty people in as well to try to uh, staunch the uh, flood of uh, reservists leaving, guardsmen leaving. Uh, Donovan should have been a general, never was, retired as a colonel, went up to OSD, later became the uh, principal deputy over at AMC in the uh, Foreign Military Sales Gate. <clears throat> but Paul was one of those uniquely gifted uh, personnelists, who understand the systems well enough that it could make dramatic change. So, so we had a strong influence on trying to help, one, recruit the reserves, and two, populate the reserves and sort of get them squared away so we get some combat power generated out of the reserves and guards. So worked heavily with them as a PA and &E and worked heavily with acquisition people and uh, had to had to work hard with the uh, Department of uh, Defense trying to get our programs approved because uh, everything was on sort of a downslope of uh, money. I recall 
one time, one year, submitting the palm and breaking the guidance. And I, I broke the guidance and I had the tape, the tape that accompanies the palm, the automatic data processing tape, had all this excess money in it, which I, we didn't have in our program. I got chastised by a guy named Russ Murray for breaking guidance about that. Big time for it. In fact, I, had a, I got a letter of censure from the then uh, Deputy uh, Secretary of Defense. Was Russ Murphy an officer or a civilian? No, Russ Murray was a civilian appointee of the, uh, the Department of Defense. He was the PAE of the Department of Defense. But what I knew about the system was I knew the system well enough that if you ever got it into the system, in the uh, in the automatic data processing data system, Bank. Yeah. then you would have to write a uh, program budget decision, a PBD, to get it out. And so this may, meant that the OSD staff had to go write all these program decision documents to get the stuff out, take them up to, to the Deputy Secretary of Defense to uh, get it out. Well, I got zapped by the then Deputy Secretary of Defense for being a Forces ass, you know, about not obeying guidance and causing the Department of Defense a great problem. So, that's one of those letters I treasure for a while. Did that come directly from him to you, or did that go to the Chief of Staff of the Army? No, I went to the, went to the Secretary of the Army. Uh, you know, it's that uh, General Thurman hadn't done his duty like he should. So that created some storm up there. Russ Moore and I are good friends. And, he's, and he sort of looks at that as, I got over on him on that one. And I made some money for the Army on that one. It was a little risky, but I had a, I had a good boss. And, uh, it all turned out fine. Well, in the summer of 79, we get in deep trouble in the personnel game. And uh, Bernie Rogers is the, uh, this is the spring of 79. And Bernie Rogers had a series of meetings in the Congress. And I would go over and I would present the Army program. And then what General Rogers would do is he would say, I'm going to give you a short introduction, and then here's the Army program, and I'd brief it, and there'd be staffers there, and guards were there. It was a one hour shot. <coughs> and uh, then the conclusion that we'd answer, we asked questions, answered questions, and uh, that was sort of a way for us to communicate to the Congress, because Chairman Rogers had formerly been the uh, OCLL guy, also been the Chief of Personnel, been the Force Comm Commander, now he was the Chief of Staff of the Army, so he's quite well known on the Hill, and this is one of the techniques he used to do that. Well, one day I went over there, and Robert Alexander was there, and Bernie Rogers was there, and some congressman asked, Cliff Alexander, if it was time to go back to the draft, and of course he poo pooed that and said, No, no, it's not time to go back to the draft. We were going down to sumping people, you know, weren't doing very well. We weren't making the strength, we weren't making the quality, any other thing. And we were opening it to 17 year old non high school graduates. Anything to increase the size of the pool. And uh, People were coming in and couldn't read in the sixth grade, you know, and the manuals were at the eleventh grade, so they couldn't handle, and, you know, on and on and on and on. And uh, Congressman turned to me and said, "Well, what do you think, General?" And I said, "Yeah, I think you could, it's time to bring back the draft." Breaking guns again. So here was the Secretary of the Army saying one thing. Here was the Low life major general saying something else. That didn't go down too well with Cliff Alexander. And uh, he was a social experimenter anyway, wasn't he? Yeah, but I mean, but that was clearly against policy. Yeah, he, he, he didn't, were, he didn't were, like that for yeah. some guy named Thurman to be against his policy like that. And he never, he never, never chastised me directly about that. But I got plenty of feedback from. The undersecretary of the Army, uh, who's a friend of mine, a guy named Walter LaBerge, 
and Walt LaBerge, you know, said, uh, you, you know, you made a big mistake, you should have said all that. So uh, then Bernie gets uh, tabbed to be the uh, uh, cure and uh, that's when General Vesey gets nominated to uh, President Carter to uh, be the Chief of Staff of the Army, or be, yeah, be the Chief of Staff of the Army, and he is not selected by President Carter. And uh, then uh, General Schreiermeyer is moved from Lieutenant General to Chief of Staff. Where, what was he? He was the best officer of the Army. And what was Fessy doing at that time? What was what? What was General Fessy doing? Fessy was the commander in Korea. Okay. And one of his subordinates had been relieved, Singlog had been relieved, saying that uh, cutting strength in Korea was a bad idea. Uh, now, I had a lieutenant colonel working for me, a guy named Harry Ota, O-T-A, Harry Ota was an operations research analyst who spent all of his time looking at personnel stuff. And uh, he's very good. And uh, so I, I had begun to follow this personnel game and see what we could do to help out the command and recruiting plan about it. But our trend line was to go to expanding the pool of unsatisfactory people in order to get more people in. Bottom fishing. Pardon? Bottom fishing. Bottom fishing. Open it up at the bottom and go get more bottom fishing. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and uh, that stuff occupied, uh, well, Bessie, by the way, then does one of the heroic acts of anybody, which after being passed over being to be the chief of staff, he agrees to be Shy Meyer's vice chief. That, that is a that is a awesome uh, dedication to public service. My uh, impression is that Bessie is a an remarkable man. He is a remarkable man, and, and that was a remarkable act on his part. I mean, the idea of getting passed over, being interviewed and not selected, and then agreeing to work for a lieutenant general who had previously been uh, Vesey's deputy. Vesey had been the desk ops when he went to Korea and Shy Meyer had been his deputy. Then Meyer gets promoted to lieutenant general, becomes the desk ops, then he gets promoted to be chief staff, and asks Vesey to come back and be his deputy, and Vesey agrees. That is unselfishness at the highest order. <coughs> so then that's when in November of 1900 and Seventy-nine is when uh, Meyer asked me to go over and find uh, recruiting service. Now Meyer and I were, uh, I, th I think I served Meyer's interests well as a PA &E. Among other things, he had a very strong relationship with uh, both Harold Brown, the Secretary of Defense, and uh, with uh, Sam Nunn, the, uh, the, who was not the chairman of the committee at that time, but he was an influential member, a Democrat member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And I recall Meyer telling me to put a presentation together one day, which would be delivered to uh, Senator Nunn. And it would be a uh, view of the uh, Army program about how the Army was being shortchanged in the DOD budget and uh, budget and program. And uh, so we did that. And the next thing I know is that uh, it had to be unclassified. So what we did is I put a team of guys in the PA need to work. Uh, and I gave them only congressional documents. I said, now I want you to back into the Army program. And 
but you can only use congressional document. You have to show me where you got every number out of some congressional document that's open for public inspection. And they had to add up. And they had to add up. Well, yeah, they had to add up. Well, it added up reasonably well. And uh, delivered that thing to Sam Nunn. And uh, about two days later, Sam Nunn is having uh, breakfast with Jimmy Carter, President Carter. And he's using these charts that have been prepared, explaining how the Army had been sure shortchanged. But also sitting there was uh, Harold Brown. And uh, it was sort of deja vu of the uh, Westmoreland briefing to uh, Mr. Nixon. I think one of those formative times that uh, you know, the right set of charts gets to the right guy and you get the right suit. So we got some additional money about that. And uh, so when, when the, uh, and that was, you know, midsummer of 1978, uh, I guess, or 79, when Shai took it over. So Shai, this is taking over, I guess in 70. He took over 78. He took over. Took over in 70. End of 78. Something or so, 78. Let's see, Meyer took over. No, he took over in the summer of 79. Or the, or the spring of 79. About that time. 